Virtually anyone can record their thoughts on any subject, and those thoughts can immediately be sent out into the ether. They don't have to be good thoughts. They can be terrible thoughts. In fact, most commonly, they are worthless thoughts that go out into the ether. And they're out there, and they're shared with the entire world, and consequently, you, in the world that you live in, have access to the voices of millions of people in the blink of an eye. You can get anyone's thoughts on virtually any topic. And all of those voices that you can hear in our culture carry with them a mountain of influence. Perhaps even ways we don't realize they influence us deeply. Fifty years ago, a person was primarily influenced by the voices of his or her teachers, his, his or her parents, his or her pastor, along with any authors this person might be reading in actual books that were actually printed on actual paper. Today, the voices that are often in our heads and that are bouncing around on any particular topic range from TV personalities to celebrities to news anchors to personalities on YouTube, on Twitter, on TikTok. I don't even know what TikTok is, to be honest with you, but it's out there. So to the point that if I throw out a topic, especially a hot topic, say something like the war in Ukraine, immigration, inflation, social justice, health care, any one of a number of hot topics, odds are, whatever your opinion of those things are, they're heavily influenced by someone you frequently listen to talk about that topic, right? Most of the topics are not even things that concern you on a daily basis or that impact your life in one way or another directly. But you have an opinion on them, and they're strong opinions, even though you've never been impacted by them. Why? Because we listen to people who are. And we listen to their opinions, and they hold a lot of sway for us. In our passage this morning, Saul is going to be formally rejected by God. It's a final, it's a done deal. He's going to be rejected by God. And next week, we're even going to see that Samuel anoints someone in David to be king over Israel. But it's here in chapter 15 that the author of 1 Samuel gets to a fine point as to what it is that precisely renders Saul unworthy of the title King of Israel. Look at our passage with me in 1 Samuel 15, 1-35. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore... Listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel, and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amal Am Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amal Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hevala as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, and of the fattened calves, and of the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, 
they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized his skirt uh, the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me, that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed before the Lord. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the word that is before us is awful. And I pray that we would receive it as such and understand it in light of what you command us to be. So I pray now that as your voice through your word is magnified, that our hearts would come to revere it, to love your word with everything that is in us, to hunger and thirst 
after the righteousness that is found in it. To delight in your law and meditate on it day and night. Only you can apply this word to our hearts. Only you know the hearts in here that are hardened toward your word and toward the gospel. So we pray that you would open them. Only you know the sin that is in the hearts of the people in this room. We pray you would bring it to light. That we may confess it, repent of it, turn from it. So Father, you alone know what is in the hearts of your people. We pray that you would reveal those things to us as we listen to your word and seek to apply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Believe it or not, Saul's kingship over Israel didn't begin terribly. His anointing was a surprise for sure. I'll give you that. He went looking for his father's donkeys. And on his mission to find some lost donkeys, he ran into Samuel. And Samuel anointed him as king over Israel. And he was shocked about that. So I'll give you that. It came a bit as a surprise. And then when it came time to introduce him to the rest of Israel, they figured out his name, and when they went to find him, where was he? Well, he was hiding among the baggage. So I'll grant you that he wasn't the bravest person in the world, for sure. However, given that Israel's king was supposed to be humble, and that Israel's king was not supposed to be a person who really wanted power and wanted authority and sought after wealth, finding a king who didn't really seem to want the authority that was going to be given to him, isn't all bad. And probably wouldn't be received as such. Plus, we know that when the Spirit rushed upon him, he was mighty in battle. In fact, the author of 1 Samuel tells us at the end of the last passage we read last week, that he defeated a lot of people and, and was actually a, a quite strong military commander and defeated a lot of Israel's enemies. So we know that Saul wasn't all bad, right? Nevertheless, he was rejected by God. I remember a couple of weeks ago in chapter 13, Saul received some standing orders from Samuel that any time he was to go and consecrate the army for battle, he had to wait in Gilgal for seven days. And at, at the end of that waiting period, Samuel was to show up and was going to perform that ritual ceremony, that sacrifice that would consecrate the army to get them ready for battle. But after Jonathan, in chapter 13, picked a fight with the Philistines, and then the Philistines sent their entire army out in retaliation, Saul and all the rest of the people got a little bit nervous, and they kind of started to run. And Saul looked around, and he sees his numbers begin to wane, and he waits literally the second he's supposed to wait, and just goes ahead and does the sacrifice anyway. Of course, this is a blatant violation of what the Lord commanded him to do. When Samuel shows up, not two seconds later, Saul meets him on the road and is wanting to preempt all of the tongue lashing he knows he's about to receive. And he explains and tries to push the blame on everyone but himself. The people were leaving. You were late. The Philistines were mustering an army, he says. And then he says, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel tells him in 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul has been rejected as king over Israel. And he's going to be replaced, which we'll see happen next week. But you see, chapter 15 is another reminder that Saul has been rejected by God. But more than that, it seems to be a psychological profile of the man Saul. And it might give us the most insight into the precise reason, the exact 
reason why he is being rejected and why his disobedience to God is more than just mere sin. But it's stronger than that. First thing that I want you to see in this passage is that Saul is rejected by God. All the kings of the Old Testament are going to sin. David is not exempt from that. David also sins. So why is it that Saul is rejected for his sin and David doesn't really seem to be? In fact, David gets a promise that his line is going to remain on the throne forever. But Saul is rejected. Well, it comes to light in the opening of chapter 15 where Saul is given this command and he's given a mission by Samuel. And the command is there in verse 1. He says, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. He's referring to what he's done in the past, not that he's anointing him now. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Now, you need to know that there is a word in verse 1 that remains untranslated in virtually every English translation that is sitting before you. You have probably something very similar to what I just read in 1 Samuel 15. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Yes, that's probably what you have printed on the page. You may not even have a note that there's anything different about that. But there is a word left untranslated. And the reason it's left untranslated is because if you were to add it into the English, it would make the English sentence sound really clunky, sound like it doesn't belong, sound like it's weird, and not give you an idea of what it means. Literally, Samuel's command to Saul is, therefore now listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. Voice is just left out altogether. Now, listening to the voice of the words of the Lord and listening to the words of the Lord is not really that different, is it? When you really think about it, listening to the voice of the words of the Lord or listening to the words of the Lord is not really different. And no theology is changed, not one iota, by leaving that word out or putting it in. And if you put it in, it makes it, the sentence in English a little bit clunky. But I think it's a mistake to leave it out because every word in this passage in chapter 15 is central to the whole passage. And every word in this verse sets the tone for the entire passage. And what really becomes the point that the author is making in this chapter. The question for Saul is going to become, to whose voice will you listen? Whose voice will you listen to, Saul? Will it be the Lord or will it be something else? God, through the prophet Samuel, sends him on a mission. And his mission is to defeat the Amalekites in battle and to devote everything and everyone connected to the Amalekites to destruction, including the livestock. And you notice he comes to that group, the Kenites, and he says, look, you were kind to us. You can go, but you better run now. And they took off, right? They're like, see ya. All right. But the Amalekites are the point, you receive the point of the, the spear. Now, Amalek was the grandson of Esau, so these people are kinsmen to Israel in some distant way. This may give modern readers, I think when we look at something like this, a little bit of uh, pause because it sounds so horrid what they're asked to do and what Saul is told, commanded to do. Devoting people to destruction. He said, including women and infants and children. It's important to recognize on a, a couple of things. First of all, it is horrid. It's meant to be terrible. And it's meant for you, when you read it, to go, that's awful. It is awful. Remember, the Bible's not trying to whitewash anything. It's not trying to scrub out anything. The details are horrendous. And at the same time, what it's bringing forward in the text is it's a picture of the reality of God's judgment. And in the event that God is loving and He's merciful, but He's also just and holy, then what we understand of this is that it has to be justified, that God must be justified in His wrath toward the Amalekites. 
And if we believe that God is loving and merciful and just and holy, which we do believe He is, and we believe that He is justified in His wrath toward anyone, then what is happening here in this passage is genuine justice. So you have to understand that. That it's genuine justice. And we find that's exactly what happened. In fact, when the children of Israel were wandering through the desert in Exodus 17, the Amalekites were the one that instead of allowing them to wander through their land, to pass through and to go to the other side and get to their destination, chose instead to fight them and to try to put them to death. So Joshua, you'll probably remember this story, even if it's vaguely remember it. Joshua goes out to the battlefield and leads Israel in the battle fight while Moses holds up his hand. And as long as Moses is holding up his hands, Israel wins the battle. And so he gets some people to help him prop up his hands, you know, as he's fighting the battle. Well, Joshua led Israel to victory. But after the battle, what we hear from God in Exodus 17, verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So you understand that this war right here that's going on with Saul is the fulfillment of a prophecy that was made 400 years ago for the Amalekites going to war with Israel, their kinsmen, instead of letting them pass through. The Amalekites sought to put Israel to death. And so God has promised, in 400 years, I'm going to come back and blot you out. So Saul has his commandment. Listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. And he's got his commission. Go and devote the Amalekites to destruction. And so we pick up in our passage in verse 9, where he says, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. Now, the principle behind devoting something to destruction, this is something Joshua did when he went into the land of Israel. It's something that we have sometimes a hard time reading and you want to just sort of read past because it's so utterly terrible. But the principle behind devoting to destruction is that you're essentially turning over all that is burned to the Lord. You're basically giving everything over to God. And in the case of people, particularly fighting people or a, an army or, or a people group that's in a particular town, what you're doing is delivering those people over to the judgment seat of God. That's essentially what's happening. God's saying, I want them before my judgment seat now. And you're giving them over to the judgment seat of God. But you're also giving all the plunder and all the spoils of war, you're giving that over to God as well. And when you do that, it's a sign to everyone watching that you don't care anything about the plunder that you've taken. In fact, you're depending on God for, to supply all of your needs. So it's not that God is reaching down and taking the gold for himself as if he needs gold. You're burning all those possessions because you're basically communicating it wasn't for possessions that we did this. It was for the judgment of God. And to the victor go the spoils. God granted the victory. God gets the spoils. That's what's being communicated. So the author makes sure that we understand all the implications of what Saul has just done. Saul and all of his people. Hey, remember, he says, all that was despised and worthless, they gave to God. So essentially, they took all the good things and they gave all the rest of it to God. They've essentially stolen what was rightfully his, but they managed to hand over all the stuff that they didn't want. But God, of course, is not going to let Saul get away with this. He tells Samuel in verse 11, I regret that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. It's another one of those verses that is perplexing, isn't it? When you read it. The idea that God regrets something. The way it could also be translated is sorry. Him saying, I'm sorry that I made Saul king. Now, by default... The way that we think about regret or sorrow, 
is in the way we would use it. We made a mistake and we regret the mistake that we made. Or we're sorry about the decision that we made. And we've come to know something now that we didn't know back then. And had we known then what we know now, we would have made a different decision, wouldn't we? And so I'm sitting here sorry for the decision that I've made because of the things that I've learned in the meantime. I don't think that's what's meant here. I don't think that's what God means when He says that here, although some people do argue that. For one, what information could God have learned now that He didn't know then? Is God growing in knowledge, as some people say that He is? Is He coming to understand things that He didn't understand before? And hey, I've got some new information, and in light of what I've just learned, I'm really sorry because I didn't see this happening. I don't think so. But for two, if you look all the way down at verse 29, it says, And also the glory of Israel, that is God, will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. Wait a second. And he used the same word there that he used back in the other one. Does he have regret or does he not have regret? And the answer is yes. Some say these two verses are an example of blatant contradiction in the Scripture. Well, you can't both have regret and be incapable of regret. Well, you can if the words are used in two different senses, which I think is how they're used here. See, the second instance here in verse 29 is in regards to Saul's punishment. The Lord is going to strip the kingdom away from Saul. That's what... Samuel has just told him, he's going to strip the kingdom completely away from you. And what Saul needs to understand is that the Lord will not change his mind about that because he is incapable of changing his mind about that. He won't have regret over that because he's incapable of doing so. Saul's punishment will be immutable. That is, it won't be changed. It is going to be steadfast. But this first instance, back here in verse whatever it is, 11, this first instance is in regards to God's sadness over Saul's sin. God is sad about the state of affairs that Saul is in. In this sense, God does have regret. But he doesn't mean it in the sense that he's learned something new that he didn't know before. Or that he didn't know that this day was going to come. In fact, in this sense we would actually express it the same way. It would be similar to if you appropriately disciplined your child. And after appropriately disciplining your child, they turned to you and said, I hate you. I never want to speak to you again. Now, that would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? Believe it or not, parents of young children, they eventually do talk back. It's crazy. I know. You don't believe they can, but they will. Imagine if they were to say that. You might say something back like, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Or, I regret that it's come to this. But would you go back and change your course of action? Absolutely not. You know that the discipline was right to an act, and you haven't learned anything new that's, come you, that's brought you to change your course of action. But at the same time, you still have sorrow over what it's brought your child to. That's, I think, the sense that he means it here even though he knew that this day was coming, even though this was the course that he had even sovereignly planned from the beginning. Yet, the fact that it's here still brings sorrow to the Lord. This is the God we actually serve. A God who is capable of both sovereign action and still sorrow. You don't want only sovereign action so that he's remotely disconnected from you and doesn't really care what you're going through. Nor do you want some God who is capricious and who just makes decisions based on the whims of other people or learns something along the way. But a God who is both sovereign and sorrowful is what, who we serve. After Samuel's lamenting all night, he goes to Saul and he says, Saul, Saul says to him, I've performed the commandment. I've done exactly what you've told me. Remember what Samuel told him was not only to go to the Amalekites, and devote them to destruction. But he said, listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. 
And here is Saul coming out to Samuel and saying, I did it. I did everything you asked me to. I, I listened to the voice of the words of the Lord. And Samuel literally responds to him in verse 14. Look at it. What then is the voice of the sheep in my ears and the voice of the oxen that I hear? Now it says there, bleeding and lowing. The word is literally voice. So Samuel, Saul comes to Samuel and he's like, I listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. And Samuel says, then why do I hear the voice of sheep and oxen? I shouldn't be hearing their voice if you listen to God's voice. Saul makes the excuse in verse 15. They brought them. The people that you gave me. They spared the sheep. They wanted to sacrifice them to the Lord. But Samuel cuts him off. Stop. No, not having it. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul in, continues to insist that he obeyed. It was the people, he says, that took the sheep. But they did it for good reason, don't you see? They, they, they took the sheep They took the sheep in honesty and integrity. We really wanted to go to Gilgal. That was the purpose of taking the sheep after all and the gold and all the other stuff too. But we took all those things for good reason. We wanted to take them and give them sacrifice. These are USDA prime sheep and oxen, Samuel. Doesn't the Lord want good quality sacrifice? We found some good spotless sheep in here. We were going to go give those to the Lord, but we were just waiting till Gilgal to do it. Samuel gets to the heart of the entire passage, and it's right here in 22 and 23. Listen to what he says here. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And finally, at the end of all that, finally Saul confesses, I feared the people and obeyed their, what is it? Voice. Whose voice are you going to listen to, Saul? Are you going to listen to the voice of the words of the Lord? I did. I listened to the voice of the words of the Lord. Then why do I hear the voice of sheep and oxen? Why did you not listen to the voice of the Lord? You did what was evil in His sight. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. What's the reason for Saul's rejection? He refused to listen to the voice of God. So when it says listen there, it doesn't mean merely hear. That I heard it. It means to obey. It's listening to the voice of God and actually then following through in obedience. So all of Saul's explanations to Samuel, if you notice, amount to Saul trying to say to Samuel, if you had just been here, if you had been in my shoes, if you had seen what I was seeing, if you had been in the circumstances that I, that I was in, you would have made the same decision. If you were in those circumstances, you wouldn't have listened to the voice of God. If you would have felt that pressure, you wouldn't have listened to the voice of God. See, in the heat of the moment, God's words seem irrational to him. But that's when God's words are put to the test, aren't they? Whether or not you really do listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. It's not in the easy times. Oh, it's easy to obey when we go home and we're excited about the word. But when the word actually confronts the precise instant where we're at in our life, where we know that the Word is conflicting with the way that we want to go, it's at that point that the Word of God is put to the test. Whose voice are you going to listen to? And it seems that every time Saul encounters opposition, he cannot at that moment listen to the voice of the words of the Lord. His confession I feared the people and obeyed their voice actually explains everything we need to know about Saul. Even if you go back to chapter 13, he feared the people as they were leaving. That is their voice. They're leaving and they're expressing, I don't want to be here. 
I'm not going to wait on your prophet to come and sacrifice. I'm getting out of here and I'm going to spare my own life. And Saul is listening there again to their voice. When the next chapter in chapter 14, what is he doing? He's out in the caves and under the pomegranate trees because the voice of the people is terrified of this great Philistine army that's out there. But that's not the voice that Jonathan seems to listen to. The voice Jonathan listens to says, who knows? Maybe the Lord will deliver these people into our hands. And so he goes out there all alone. Time after time, Saul's actions can be explained by this simple confession, I feared and obeyed the voice of the people. So, what do we see next? God rejected Saul. Saul rejected God. God rejected Saul. Saul wants a pardon. He, he expresses as much to Samuel. He wants Samuel to come back with him and offer sacrifice on his behalf, and bow before the Lord, confess. But Samuel gives it to him straight. In verse 26, Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe and tore it, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel to, from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Ouch. Saul actually appeals to Samuel three times to ask him to come back with him so that he can be forgiven. And Samuel responds to the first two of those appeals with outright rejection. In verse 26, he tells him, absolutely not. So the second appeal is Saul reaching out and grabbing his robe and it tours, and Samuel uses it as an object lesson and he turns and he says, just like how my robe just tore, so God has torn the kingdom away from you. And finally, on the third appeal, Saul makes mention of all the people so that he can save face in front of Israel. Now imagine what would happen if all the people of Israel not only saw Saul, Saul as a reject, but actually that God has gotten rid of him and is selecting a new king. What would that do to the nation of Israel? And so it's on this third appeal that Samuel gives in and actually allows Saul to save face in front of his people. But Saul's repentance is still a repentance that cares way more about what everybody else thinks of him than what the Lord thinks of him which is the very subject of fear, isn't it? Of Saul's fear of man is being concerned with what everyone else thinks of him rather than what God thinks of him. God's about to hand the kingdom over to another. We'll see David, the son of Jesse, in the next chapter. But remember, David is described a couple of chapters ago as one that is after the Lord's own heart. Look back with me in chapter 13, verse 14. It says this, But now your kingdom shall not continue. This is the first time Saul is rejected. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. This, we come to find out, is what it means to be after the Lord's own heart. What does that mean, to be after the Lord's own heart? It's that he listens to the voice of the Lord and he obeys his commands. This is the reason Saul is rejected. It's the reason David is elected. The Lord is seeking this from his people. To not only listen and hear his words, but actually follow after them and obey and come to love the words that He's giving to them. That's what God is commanding of His people. And believe it or not, this is bad news for us. This is bad news for us. We could be very quick to judge Saul as a reject king who in spite of having every opportunity available to him, Continue to listen to the voice of the people instead of the voice of God. But I wonder if we ourselves are not also guilty of some of the same things that Saul is guilty of. If what it means to be a man or a person after God's own heart 
is to listen to and obey the commands of God, then which of us in this room would describe himself or herself as the text describes David? Which of you would be so bold as to stand up and say, I am a man or a woman after God's own heart? That's me. That text describes me to a T. With the various voices that we have bouncing around in our ears on a daily basis, from TV, 24-hour news, to podcasts, to music, to movies and entertainment of all kinds, to friends, both godly and ungodly. Who among us is threading the needle perfectly on what it means to listen to and obey the voice of God over the culture? When you actually think about the reason Saul is rejected as king over his people, he's guilty of sins of which we are all guilty. And what we'll find out is that even David is guilty of those sins. Even David will be guilty of those sins. Yet, David's repentance seems to be genuine, where it seems that Saul's is not. But even David will not fulfill this perfectly. Perfect obedience that the Lord is requiring is a weight that none of us can bear. Do you understand that? It's a weight you cannot perform perfectly. See, this is the importance of Jesus' sinlessness. What is required of Saul and David, for that matter, and every king of Israel that would ever come after, and every person in Israel that would ever come after, and every person on the face of the earth that would ever be there before or after, what they fail to accomplish, but what is required of them, Jesus actually accomplishes. He is sinless. He is perfectly righteous. See, the rest of humanity, that includes you and me, would be rejected on the same grounds that Saul is rejected. But Jesus' obedience to God is without flaw. So when He dies on the cross, He cannot be punished for His own sins because He doesn't have them, you understand. He can't be punished for sinfulness because He isn't sinful. The sin that He dies for is mine and yours. And the righteousness that He attained, He also didn't use for Himself because He's there on the cross dying. A righteous person doesn't have to suffer death. Yet Christ did suffer it. He suffered for our sins. And the righteousness that He earned, He didn't keep for Himself, but He gave to His people. And so now that Jesus is King over His people... His righteousness provides, is provided for all of us. Our confession of sin, then, is an admission. That's what we're doing. When we come here together, or even at home, when we confess sin in private or in public, our confession of sin is an admission that whatever righteousness we could possibly ever offer up to God would never be enough to merit eternal life. So it's at the foundation, at its core, it is an admission of our, that our righteousness is not enough. There are not enough prayers you can pray or righteousness you can perform that would ever gain you eternal life. We require the righteousness of Christ offered in our place. It's an admission that the voice of God is often veiled to us because of our sin. It's an admission of our need of God's forgiveness. Jesus says in John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There may be some of you, even now, who see your sin before you, who know very truly what, what that sin is, who may even feel guilty even now over that sin, following the voice of God not only causes us to see our sin for what it is, understand it for what it is, 
not only feel conviction over that sin, like actually feel sorry for that sin, not only confess that sin to God, but then also turn and trust Christ. That is what the voice of God does. So when Jesus says here, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. What that means is they not only see their sin in front of them and feel sorrow for it, but actually confess their sin to God and trust in Christ for forgiveness. Now, if it's the case that you feel conviction over your sin, then hear the voice of God to you. Confess it. Trust Christ for forgiveness. You understand that every day, that is the pattern of the Christian. The pattern of the Christian life is is every day confessing our sin to the Lord and trusting Christ for our righteousness. Do you now hear the voice of Christ? And do you follow it? Jesus also says in verse 26, which is the verse that comes right before that, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. This is his explanation for a refusal to follow his voice. An explanation, if you will, for Saul's actions. An explanation for any king of Israel's action. An explanation for any disobedient, God-hating person out there. An explanation for your own refusal to confess your sin before the Lord. A refusal for your own refusing to trust Christ. An explanation for your refusal to actually wholeheartedly engage in the worship of God Sunday after Sunday. What is it? You do not believe because you're not among my sheep. Because my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. A refusal to trust in Christ for your forgiveness, a refusal to listen to His voice, is evidence of your rejection. Friend, in your case, you'll stand before uh, God on Judgment Day, and all your works will be laid bare. When your righteousness compares to the holiness of God, Do you think that you'll be able to stand on Judgment Day? I dare say you won't even be able to look Him in the eyes. So I would urge you to listen to the voice of God and repent and trust Christ. And that includes those of you who feel like, look, my sin is too great. There's no way God would ever forgive me for this sin. I know what it is. I know how often I partake in it, and there's no way God would ever forgive me of that. That is also a rejection of Christ, you understand. It's a rejection of Christ masquerading itself as self-deprecation. But ultimately, it's a rejection of Christ. If you don't hear the voice of Christ and follow it, you will, like Saul, be rejected by God. Brothers and sisters, When it comes to hearing the voice of God, if you surveyed an audience of Christians, you would probably get many answers as to what it means to hearing the voice of God. Some of those answers might say something like, follow your heart. Let your conscience be your guide. But understand that the king, Saul in this case, is not told by Samuel, the prophet, to let his conscience be his guide. He doesn't tell him, follow your heart, Saul. Saul's heart tells him to run. Saul's heart tells him to listen to the words of the the voice of the words of the people. Samuel doesn't say that. Samuel says, thus says the Lord. Meaning God has put His words in my mouth. And I'm telling you exactly what God says to you. Listen to this voice. Because it's telling you exactly what God thinks. Not follow your heart. 
Not listen to your conscience. Do what I'm telling you because it's what God tells you. Today, we have the literal words of God recorded for us from Genesis to Revelation. This is a prophet standing in front of you that is telling you, thus says the Lord. If you want to hear God speak out loud to you, then read the Bible out loud. This is God's voice to you. This is His counsel to us. These words are meant for us to know who God is so that our hearts and our minds are shaped like His heart and mind. So that we begin to think like God thinks about reality. It informs the way we think about the world around us. It informs our worldview. It informs how we understand what a man and a woman is. It informs how we understand what a right relationship looks like, what a marriage looks like, what friendships look like, what family should look like, what your responsibilities as parents look like, what your role is as a single person or as a married person, what your role is as a father or a husband or a mother or a wife. All of those thoughts and opinions are shaped by the Word of God. By His counsel to you. And the more you come to know God, the more your opinions, your thoughts, begin to be shaped by His thoughts. So to listen to the voice of God will never be this arbitrary feeling that you get in your gut. The voice of God is the Holy Scriptures that we submit ourselves to every day. Christians are to be people of the book. Meaning that our opinions are to be shaped by God's very character that we find revealed to us on the pages of Scripture. Now, we do often say, don't we, I just felt God say to me. Especially when we're in a situation where we're convinced of a direction that God is wanting us to go. But you need to understand It's only by knowing God's character, only, only by knowing His nature and His commands revealed to us in the Bible, that we can be informed in those situations. Right? It's only by understanding who He is and understanding what His Word says that in those situations we become disturbed by them or provoked by them and moved in one way or another. So we should be able to say, not just, I felt God say to me. We should be able to say, God says in His Word. As a way to justify our course of action. In any situation we're in, it's often the case that the Holy Spirit will prompt us, will remind us, will stir us, will push us one direction or another, will cause us to caused to come to mind something that we would have otherwise forgotten. But you understand that those promptings and reminders must be entirely consistent with His character and His Word as it's revealed on the pages of Scripture. Or, if not, that's not the voice of God that you're listening to. Just because it's a still, small voice inside you, doesn't mean that it's God. Satan also knows how to whisper. And he convinces a a lot of people a lot of times that this is what God means. This is what he says. Not only that, he tried to do the same thing to Jesus by quoting God's word to him. So that still small voice can also be something else whispering to you. It must be grounded in the actual meaning of God's word. We must be people of the book so that we can discern the actual voice of God from the lies of the enemy. And with the many voices that surround you in the culture, it's easy to make a steady diet of lies. There's a member of our congregation, whom you all know, who might be sitting over in this direction, whose name is Mr. James Connor, who always says to me, 
And he always says out loud and I can hear him and, and it's, it's come to reverberate around my ears. It's come to bounce between my ears from time to time. He always says, but what does God say? And it's a great question. What does God say? No doubt we all hear many voices, but the question becomes the same as it was to Saul. Which voice are you going to listen to? What does God say about this? See, it was our desire to actually be people of the book. Is our desire really to take the words of the Scriptures and read them so that we might know what God says and actually dive into them and study them so we might know not only what He says, but actually what He means. And then are we willing to take not only what He says and what He means, but then apply them to where we are today so that we might know what really that matters for us in the here and now? That is the question for us as a church. That's the question for you as a Christian. That's the question for any follower of Christ. Is that really what we're willing to do? Well, if so, how is that modeled in your life? In terms of time, how much time are you giving to the voice of the culture versus the voice of the words of the Lord? Who gets the lion's share of the portion of your life, of your thought life, of your devotional life? Who gets the lion's share of say as to what go, what's going on in our culture? Whose lens do we look through to see everything else around us? Whose voice do you listen to? The voice of God or the voice of someone or something else? That question for Saul is the same question it's always been for God's people. And it is today. Whose voice are you going to listen to? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your voice would ring loud in our ears. Lord, we have often read your word, quoted your word, and yet never given thought to its meaning and its application for us. We've probably used your word as a weapon once or twice or many times. We've probably put it on the walls of our homes and never given thought to what it actually means or says to us today. So, Father, I pray for your help as we teach, as we preach, as we learn what your word really means and how it applies to us today, that it would make us steadfast, immovable, abounding in your work in this world that it would give us all the confidence in the world knowing that even in death they cannot harm the soul. Make our consciences and our hearts pure before you. Fill them with your word so that we might apply them in any and every context we might come into. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.